seats we see that could crowd out. We'd like to welcome you this morning, especially the visitors. Uh, if you look in the pew there, you'll find a uh, visitor card, and we ask you to fill that out and put it in the offering plate when it comes around. Good bit going on today. Um, got a got a day full of activities. Looking forward to it. Uh, Pastor Appreciation Day today. Uh, we'd uh, I can't think of a better time than right now for our church as a whole to uh, let Miss Leslie and the family and Brother Andy know how much we appreciate. It. Uh, thank y'all. In addition to the pastor appreciation, we're having lunch. Invite everybody to join us there. Uh, fall festival this afternoon. Uh, starting at 5, Brother Andy will have the devotion. And then uh, after that, the hot dogs and hamburgers for the kids. And then they'll get into the all the activities of the trunk and treat. So that's going to be fun. Uh, going on down the list there, we've got the um, Baptist Association coming up, the annual meeting there at Weathersby on November the 3rd. Meals of Love, Tuesday, November the 5th. Then we've got a looking forward to the children's puppet skit on November the 10th. That's always a lot of fun. <clears throat> and then we've got the Blessing of the Hunt coming up on Thursday, November the 14th. We're going to ask Jeffrey to give a little more information on that. If you didn't uh, get to do that last year if you wasn't with us. And it was real successful. It was a good fundraiser. And Jeffrey, you want to explain? Yeah, the 14th, and we need everybody's help. This is going to be a fundraiser for Mr. Rick Patrick, and y'all know what he's going through. So we need everybody involved. This isn't just the uh, the hunters of the church or the community. Uh, women, whatever, we're going to have, uh, you know, we've already had a, I don't know, custom-made table donated. We need donations for our auction. We need donations for door prizes. Or we just need monetary donations to help Mr. Rick out. So that's going to be the 14th. We've got a lot of good food. It's not going to be just wild game. Kay made some jambalaya, right, last year? That was fabulous. So we need people to cook. We're going to do uh, Jerry's Fish. Uh, we're going to have fish. We're also going to have the wild game. And I think uh, we're going to have some uh, jalapeno hush puppies, right? Uh, I think 14th. Papa Dale can cook in the hush puppies now. They're good. Um, anybody have anything else as far as announcements we need to bring forward this time? If anyone here would like to go to the uh, Mississippi Baptist State Convention, it starts tomorrow, October the 28th. If you would like to go, uh, see me after the service, I, and I can fill out a card, and I know that uh, you get a blessing by being there, but it's it's Monday and Tuesday, and maybe part of Wednesday, but you can come and go as you please. You don't have to stay there all day, but it's a, it's a good time of meeting, so if you'd like to go to that, just get with me after the service today. Okay, nothing else. Let's bow in prayer, please. <clears throat> Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day, this special day you've given us, Heavenly Father, to uh, come in and worship you, Lord. We pray that nothing would distract us from hearing your word today from Brother Andy. Bless him, Father, and we thank you for him and his family, Lord. God, we just pray that you'd go with us in the coming week, that we would be a shining light for you, God, and just uh, be an example for you and, and help spread your word. I'd ask you now, God, just to forgive me where I fall short and help us all just to be better servants for you. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Good morning. As you may know, it's Operation Christmas Child shoebox time again, and uh, this is our 23rd year as a church serving with this ministry. And for those of you that are new to our church, this is an evangelistic children's ministry that goes around the world uh, trying to teach and lead children to Christ. And this morning, I wanted to share a video by Franklin Graham that really and truly shows the joy and the blessings of this ministry.
let the little children come to me. Don't forbid them, for such is the kingdom of God. Assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. Operation Christmas Child is a way for the little children to come to Almighty God. That is the best gift of all, is becoming part of God's family. The mission of Operation Christmas Child never changes. Children are coming to Jesus, children are being discipled, and children are taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. These children are brave and bold, not afraid, and they're not ashamed of the gospel. They're trained and equipped to go out and share their faith with others. And many times in areas where it's an unreached people group, the Bible tells us the time is now. Let them come, Jesus said, let them come. And they're coming. They're coming by the millions. Every single box represents the life of a young boy, a young girl, who will be touched by the gospel. Jesus has come to give them light, that they do not need to be in the darkness, that they have hope, that they have joy. And it is our prayer that this glorious light of the gospel will flow among the nations and will fill our land with the knowledge of the glory of God. The Lord God Almighty desires to fulfill His redemptive plan for mankind in and through each of us and all of us. All of us are children of God. We share this incredible opportunity to take the gospel truly to the ends of the earth by gathering children to Jesus. I believe this year for Operation Christmas Child, this may be the most important year, most important opportunity that we'll ever have to reach the children in the name of Jesus Christ. Pray that God will use these shoebox gifts to make a difference in the children's life for eternity. Good to see everybody this morning. Uh, Brother Andy, for Pastor Appreciation Day, I've got a small gift here to present to you. On behalf of Corinth Baptist Church, we uh, we thank you for your obedience and your commitment, uh, along with Miss Leslie and the family. Uh, thank you so much for your leadership. And uh, so on behalf of the church, we thank you for your service. Thank you for your commitment. Thank you so um, much. You surprised we did, me. Yes. We, did, we did a little behind the scene investigating and understand you could use a new pair of boots so that's right that, that, that should right. take care of you there. <laughs> let me while i'm here let me just say thank you thank you so much thank you well you surprised me that wasn't in the bulletin but uh uh you can't always go by the bulletin we've learned that at corinth baptist church we thank god for you each one of you as i see your faces out here today each one of you as uh, we go through the week uh, we pray for you we love you in the lord and uh, we're excited about what God is doing, and we just thank you for the privilege to serve the Lord here with you on behalf of myself, my wife, Leslie, and our whole family. Thank you, and may God bless you. Thank you so much. Thank you. We started off right, didn't we? Let's sing about the mercies of God. 100, uh, 625, would you stand as we sing? 625. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing, I will sing, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord. Let's do it again. I will sing of the mercy of the Lord. Sing the chorus. With my mouth I will acknowledge His faithfulness, Thy faithfulness. With my mouth will I acknowledge the faithfulness of all generations. I will sing God of the Lord forever. I will sing. I will sing. I will sing 
just a short walk around. I want you to look around. If you see a visitor or somebody you want to talk to, go to that person. Okay, let's go. I'm going to see It's sweet, it's sweet and short. I love it. Thank you so much. Well, it's a, it's, a, it's a good problem to have, to have so much going on. I tell you what, I don't want to hear one complaint about it because uh, when things are going on, the Lord is moving and everything that's been discussed to this point today uh, has been a blessing. Operation Christmas Child, you see all those shoe boxes back there? Those are going to be a blessing for some child around the world to come to know Jesus Christ. You'd be a part of that. All the other activities, the, the, uh, uh, the blessing of the hunt that's coming up, it's going to be a blessing for Brother Rick and Miss Carol Patrick. And There's so many ways for you to be involved in here at the church, and we invite you to do that. Uh, but today, actually, is a special day uh, because I've felt led some uh, weeks ago to take the opportunity to do what the prophet Joel said in uh, his book. And, and do you believe the Bible? If you believe the Bible, say amen. amen. If you don't, get with me after church, all right? I want to talk to you about that. But I believe the Bible through and through, and God said through the prophet Joel in chapter 2, when his people, his nation was going the wrong way. Joel said, blow the trumpet in Zion. Consecrate a fast. Call a sacred assembly. Gather the people. Sanctify the congregation. Assemble the elders. Gather the children, the nursing babies. Let the bridegroom go out from his chamber and the bride from her dressing room. Let the priest who minister to the Lord weep between the porch and the altar and let them say, spare your people, O Lord. Do not give your heritage to a reproach that the nation should rule over them. Why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? Then the Bible says the Lord will be zealous for his land. He will pity his people. The Lord will answer and say to his people, Behold, I send you grain and new wine and oil, and you will be satisfied by them. I'll no longer make you a reproach among the nations. Do you believe the word of God? I do. You and I are facing a day in which we never thought we would face when we see America going the way it is going, morally, spiritually. I spoke somewhere this week, and uh, the best way I could say is it's in the gutter. It's gone just about as low as it can go, but God is not through with the work that he's doing. And I asked uh, a few weeks ago for you to be in prayer for next Sunday November the 3rd. We're going to be meeting here. We're going to dedicate a special time of prayer. And not just a time of prayer, but a time of leading up to that prayer that involves fasting. That's what Joel said. Proclaim a fast and pray. Where Leslie and I have had the privilege to go minister in India, they actually have fasting prayers in their church every Tuesday night at 9 o'clock at night. People come and they've not eaten all day and they come to pray and ask the Lord to minister in their lives and in the lives of their families and in the church and in the nation. So I asked Brother Wayne Hill to come this morning. And Brother Wayne, if you would come and uh, walk us through, where is Brother Wayne? Well, come on up here. Walk us through a little bit because Wayne and I have talked and I know that, uh, now Jesus said when you fast, don't let anybody know about it. And, and, and that's the way we should do it. It's, this is between you and the Lord. And I'm not challenging anyone here if you have a medical issue or something that keeps you from fasting. I'm not asking you to do that. But I am asking you to ask the Lord what he wants you to do, all right? And you do what you feel led to do 
in preparation for next Sunday, November 3rd, the Sunday before this coming important election. We're going to gather, we're going to pray, and we're going to be fasting as we pray. So Brother Wayne, come walk us through uh, what the Bible has to say. Just a few moments about fasting, and you may learn something. And all of this is rooted and grounded in the Word of God. As a matter of fact, Jesus himself fasted. And when he taught the Sermon on the Mount, he said, not if you fast, but when you fast, saying he expects us to fast. And there are some situations Jesus said that cannot be addressed except by fasting and prayer. So, Brother Wayne, would you lead us just a few moments through the Word of God on the subject of fasting? Brother Andy told me I didn't have a 45 minute. <laughs> Was that 45 or 4 or four, 5? 4 dash 5. 4 or 5. Right. Okay. All right. You know, Brother Andy, I hope I'm not the guy that the preacher called on to come to the church and, and uh, make a little, you know, do the service. And he was all nervous, had his little notes inside his coat pocket. And, he started off with Adam and Eve and <laughs> looked in there and then he went to Moses and he got to the one that uh, after God's own heart and he didn't know it but his little notes had fallen out of his pocket and when he got to that he opened his coat and said man after God's own heart was J.C. Penny." <laughs> 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 he read the label in his coat <laughs> uh, a lot of this, and like Brother Andy said, fasting is definitely between you and God. And all throughout Scripture, different ones called a fast, and they called a corporate fast, which included the entire church, and a lot of times the entire nation. And I know y'all remember, uh, made a donation to Jensen Franklin Media Ministries for Israel and we joined them every year and have for over 15 years I'm not really sure but the first or second Sunday in January his entire church uh, goes on a 21 day fast uh, which is a Daniel fast and that's what we do for the uh, first of the year which means no bread no sweets drink water, a lots of water, fruit juice, vegetables, and fruit. And I think, Mona, you started joining, what, about seven or eight years ago? We've seen a lot of prayers answered, haven't we, sister? Mm -hmm. it, it, we really have. And <clears throat> I looked up the Hebrew word for fasting and, or fast, and it the meaning, definition, I can't pronounce the word, but the definition of it is not to eat. And I went ahead and looked up the dictionary definition, and it says fasting, to abstain from food or to eat sparingly of certain foods. And I want to share something, a little personal testimony this morning. Of all of the years that I fasted, I have failed several different occasions. And the reason being lack of prayer, lack of Bible study, and lack of worship during the fast. And during any fast, you've got to spend time in prayer, in the Word of God, and worship God, because fasting is worshiping God. Yeah. And fasting without prayer is just a diet. That's all it is. Mm -hmm. Nothing right. more. Yeah. And like you had mentioned earlier, brother, I believe it's in the sixth chapter of Matthew. He says, when you pray, when you fast, and when you give, not if, but when. So I think we as Christians are expected to fast. Uh, Jesus fasted before he ever began his ministry. And, uh, you know, we, we asked the question, why did Jesus fast? Why? He shouldn't have needed to fast. I think in the main thing is to set an example for us, to show us if Jesus fasted, we certainly should. The other thing, I think that he fasted for more strength from the Father. And I go a little bit further with that. It's in uh, 
Matthew 17, the disciples, a man brought his son to the disciples who was demon possessed, and the disciples could not cure him. They couldn't do anything for him, and they brought him to Jesus. Well, Jesus rebuked the demons, and in verse 21 of chapter 17 in Matthew, he was talking to his disciples and they couldn't understand why they couldn't cast out the demons. And in chapter uh, verse 21, he says, however, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. That's the only way those demons could be uh, thrown out is through prayer and fasting. Amen. Yes, my notes are on the floor, brother. <laughs> you know, we ask, why should I fast? And people fast for different reasons. Uh, you may be in need of a spiritual direction, uh, wisdom, healing, uh, a miracle, a closer encounter with the Lord. There are a lot of reasons that we fast, but the main purpose, and I promise you from experience, if you will fast and pray and draw near to God, you will be amazed at how he draws near to you. It, it, it's really, it's, it's, it's an experience, and I know a lot of y'all have fasted before, but uh, this is something that I think we need to do. Uh, It'll give us a deeper connection with him, uh, humility, recognizing that he is sovereign, uh, increase our faith, self-discipline, and probably the most important benefit is to show God that we are serious about a relationship with him. Amen. When we fast, uh, we get his attention. I think that, uh, you know, we... We see God in ways that we wouldn't experience through a normal, our normal daily lives. Uh, there were so many that fasted in biblical times. Brother Andy hit on one, Joel, but you got Ezra, Elisha, Saul, Esther, Daniel, Paul. There's some pretty good names there that, that fasted. And you know, if they needed to fast as close as they were to God, we definitely need to. Uh, I strongly, strongly recommend that each one of you go to the concordance in the back of your Bible and look up fast and fasting. And there's many, many scriptures on fasting. If you will take before we start this fasting, some of you might want to do a three-day or four-day or even a week, but before you start it, go to, the, go to the Word of God and look up fast and fasting and study some of those scriptures. It'll really give you an insight into what fasting is all about. Uh, a lot of this is just uh, my personal testimony. Everybody's got a different one. Uh, everybody's got a different way of getting close to God, but fasting, prayer are the two main things. And let's, let's spend that time in prayer during this fast. Amen. Uh, it's one of the most overlooked sources of power that every believer has. You know, we, we get in trouble and we do this and do that, but fasting with prayer I promise you, you'll get the answer that you're looking for from Amen. God. And we're not trying to persuade him our way. The whole purpose is his will for us. Amen. And I thank y'all for the time. To God be the glory. Amen. Thank you, Brother Wayne. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that, Brother Wayne. So the, the challenge for you and for me is to take this coming week. We can start right now. 
and ask the Lord what he would have you to do. What, what would he have you to give up this weekend as we prepare to pray for our nation, for our country next Sunday? And also, as Brother Wayne mentioned, take that extra time, whatever you're giving up and getting, getting out of your life for this period of time, you replace that with God in prayer and in opening his word and drawing closer to him. And God said, when you do that, I will hear from heaven. He said, I'll forgive their sin. What's that? Pray fast and vote. That's a, good, that's a good combination. Thank you, Brother Wayne. Let's pray right now, and then we'll continue to worship. Lord, we, do, we come to you this morning. God, we're so thankful that we, we have a service that is full of different ways that we can serve you, Lord. And we thank you, God, for the way that you're moving in each and every ministry. We pray you'll bless all the activities today, the fall festival, Lord, and all the children that will come here. Thank you for Operation Christmas Child. Thank you for the, the fellowship that we're about to have. Bless all of this, God, and may you get all the glory. But, Lord, we want to get serious about praying for our country, praying for our state, praying for our families and for one another, Lord. So we pray, God, you'd show us, each one of us in our lives, how that we may fast to give up food or Lord, to focus more on you during that process as well as we give up something and we say less of this and more of Jesus. God, we pray you will bless this country. We pray you'll have mercy on our country and on our land. God, prepare us for this special service next Sunday. And may you get all the glory and God do a miracle and change the direction, Lord of the way of sin that our country's heading in. Bring revival, bring restoration, bring forgiveness, Lord. And we do pray, God, your Holy Spirit will move and lead. And God bless America again. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. For our offertory, we're going to sing 102 and then flip over to 111 to finish it out. Stand as we sing, please. Think about his love and the love of God. Think about his love. Think about his love. Thank you, be seated.
through the minor prophets, it seems that there's doom and gloom and um, a warning to the countries, but also out throughout there, there's a, the promise of redemption. So the choir is going to sing, Redemption Draweth Nigh. Praise the Lord. Redemption draweth nigh. That is, it's not the title of my message today, but it is tying right into the theme of the book of Micah. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the, the prophet Micah in the Old Testament, only seven chapters long, and uh, you'll find Micah, you'll find Micah after Joel and Amos, and then after uh, Jonah, you'll find the book of Micah. 
It's a small book, but it's an important book, and uh, we're going to focus today on what uh, this song that we just sung, the message of it is to, that as, as bad as things look, as difficult as they look, as, as much judgment is due upon our land, upon our people, redemption does draw nigh. God is not done. He's not through moving, and he's got a plan, and it's a plan of mercy and salvation. He is the God of justice and of mercy. Now, I want to ask you this morning, as we turn to Micah chapter 7 and verse 14, I want to ask you to focus your attention on uh, these passages of Scripture as we read them together. This is the end of the book of Micah. Just by way of introduction, the word Micah, the name Micah, means who is like our God, who is like Jehovah. And the answer is, there ain't nobody like God, all right? He's one of a kind. He's the only God, all right? That's what Micah's name means. Who is like Jehovah? I want you to bear that in mind as we read Micah 7, verse 14. This is a prayer and also God's promise. Verse 14, shepherd your people with your staff, the flock of your heritage who dwell solitarily in a woodland in the midst of Carmel. Let them feed in Bashan and Gilead as in the days of old. As in the days when you came out of the land of Egypt, I will show them wonders, God said. Verse 16, the nations shall see and be ashamed of all their might. They shall put their hand over their mouth. Their ears shall be deaf. They shall lick the dust like a serpent. They shall crawl from their holes like snakes of the earth. They shall be afraid of the Lord our God, and they shall fear because of you. Notice verse 18. Who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity, and passing over the transgression of the remnant of his heritage. He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in mercy. I want you to underline that. God delights in mercy. He will again have compassion on us and he will subdue our iniquities. And you say, Paul's right there. I want you to look at me. You say, preacher, what does God do with our sins? What does God do with our iniquities? It says he would pardon them. It says he would subdue them. What does he do? The end of verse 19 tells us, you will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. You will give truth to Jacob and mercy to Abraham, which you have sworn to our fathers from days of old. And ladies and gentlemen, that is the mercy of our great God. God takes our sins when we're right with the Lord Jesus Christ, when we come to saving faith in God through Christ and the finished work of Calvary's cross, no matter what sins you have committed, no matter what errors you have made, no matter the, the heinousness of your life, God takes our sins because of what Jesus has done. And he throws them in the deepest sea. And the Bible doesn't say this, but you'll understand when I say, and God puts up a sign that says, no fishing allowed, amen. When your sins have been dealt with, when you've been forgiven, it's not because of you, it's not because of what you have done, it is because of what Jesus has done. And the book of Micah, though it was written 740 years before Jesus came the first time, it has a message for you and me today, and it's the message that he is a God of justice and mercy. The book of Micah, the prophet Micah, was an old country preacher, and he preached from the year 740 B.C. to about 700 B.C. Now, in the last few services, I have brought to your attention the fact that these minor prophets were ministering to God's people at a critical time. It was a time of division, it was a time of rampant sin in the land. It was a time when God's people had totally got away from God and they weren't coming back. And God raised up these minor prophets. They're only called minor prophets because their, their message was short. How many of y'all like a short message? You're gonna love the message today, all right? <laughs> Maybe. God's word to the point in all the minor prophets was this. There's sin in our land. You need to repent of it. 
God is going to bring judgment on this land because of sin. But ladies and gentlemen, I'm so glad to tell you that Micah, like all the other minor prophets, at the end of that judgment, at the end of that God dealing with sin, there is a light that shines. And God says, I've got mercy on the other side. Don't we serve a great God? No wonder Micah said, who? Who is a God like you? There's none other. Only God. And by the way, nobody else can forgive your sin. Nobody else can heal your, the need of your heart. Nobody else can give you life eternal and hope for glory forever. Only God can do that. And we worship Him today. The book of Micah, 740 years before Jesus was born, to a people that were divided. The country had broken in half. And I think if there's ever been a time that our country has been divided, it's divided right now. I know for a fact that there was a time in our nation's history that our own nation had a civil war and the South seceded from the North and the North and the South were separate countries. And that, is a, that was a very real division and what a destructive division it was. By the way, have you ever considered that more people died in the Civil War, the war between the states, than all the other wars of America combined. Brother against brother. Division. God deliver us from that spirit of division. We need to understand we are one nation under God. And we're not under a person or a corporation or a United Nations. All those may have a place. We're under God. And it is the God of justice and of mercy that Micah preached to that northern kingdom that had broken off and had fallen into idolatry, the sin of idolatry, and its capital was Samaria. Flip back to Micah chapter 1. Micah chapter 1, verse 1. This is the word of the Lord that came to Micah of Moresheth in the days of King Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, which he saw concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. Those are two cities that are two capitals. Samaria was the capital of the northern kingdom. That's where the first king of the northern kingdom had set up a golden calf and told the people, come up here and worship. You don't need to go to Jerusalem anymore. Don't go down to the temple. You can stay right here at home and worship God just as good when you go to the golden calf of Samaria. And that was a lie from the pits of hell. And then there was Jerusalem. Now, Jerusalem was God's city, the city of Zion, where the temple of God was built. And the people of Jerusalem and the southern kingdom, as it was known of Judah, were sitting there watching the judgment that was coming upon that northern kingdom. They saw the Assyrians when they came and invaded in 722 B.C. The kingdom of Assyria would invade the northern kingdom and destroy Samaria and destroy all those idolatrous places of worship. And the people of Judah in Jerusalem, what they said to themselves was this. They said, well, we're here in Jerusalem. This is God's city. And as long as we just stay close to home, we'll be fine. Doesn't matter how we live. Doesn't matter what we do. Doesn't matter what kind of sins we allow into our land. This is God's city. It's God's temple. And God, they said, would never allow it to be destroyed. And boy, were they wrong. The prophet Micah said, as much sin as had been going on in that northern kingdom, and it was due destruction of Samaria and of Israel, and that happened under the hand of Assyria. The prophet Micah takes his bony country preacher finger and he points at Jerusalem and he says, you're just as guilty because you've allowed the people of God to suffer injustice. You've taken advantage of the poor. You have fallen into idolatry yourself. He said to the people of God, you have allowed your own worship to become idolatrous because you're just going through a form of worship and you're not getting to the heart of the matter. And God says from Micah, you too, Judah, southern kingdom, Jerusalem, you too will be judged. I'm so glad, though, there's mercy on the other side. This past week, I went to drive early in the morning to a prayer breakfast in Collins, Mississippi. And I forget what day it was, but the sky was clear and bright, and I was singing as I'm often apt to do when I'm driving by myself. If y'all ever drive by me and see me singing, you can say, there he goes again, all right? 
singing loud. All right. I've done it all my life. And I was singing the praises of God, and I was thinking about preaching that word from Joel about the day of the Lord coming. And he said it'll be like a day of fire on the mountains, and the sun will grow dark. And it was about that time as I was singing and thinking about all those things that I passed through McGee, and suddenly the sky grew dark. <laughs> And there was a cloud in front of me. It was enveloping my pickup truck and all of those folks on the highway around me. And I realized as I then began to smell, it was not a cloud of air or moisture. It was a cloud of smoke. And I thought again about Joel, the cloud of smoke and the darkness of the sun. And I, there was a part of me that wanted to pull that truck over and just stop because I didn't really feel like I could keep going. The further I went, went, the darker I became enveloped in this smoke and the more it filled my nostrils and I thought something bad is going on. Where there's that much smoke, there's bound to be some fire, amen. I don't know where the fire was. I never did know, I just kept going. But you know, that's like the judgment of God. When God pronounces his righteous judgment against sin, and he does, and he will correct us in our sin, he does it in a way that definitely gets our attention. But if we keep going, like we keep traveling through the prophets of Micah, and then we'll get to Zechariah and Zephaniah, and we'll get all the way down to Malachi, what we'll understand is God does bring judgment. He does punish sin. He is a God of justice, and he will not let it go undealt with. But praise God, that's not all he is. That's not all of who God is. He is a God of mercy. And as I kept traveling south, I noticed this, that finally, through the thickness of the smoke, I could see the sun coming up. And it was a red and it was a strange looking sun coming up as I was headed south. And finally, when I pierced through the last of that smoke, the sun shone brightly again. And I appreciated something that I didn't appreciate before. The bright blue sky and the sun shining. I took it for granted when I was on the other side of the smoke. But having passed through it, I understood what a big deal it is that God made the sun come up again. He breaks through the clouds, and we have the blue sky to enjoy. God's mercy, I want to share with you four things very quickly this morning, very quickly about the mercy of God. And if you're here today and maybe you've been experiencing the judgment of God, and if you are, I want you to understand that that in itself is mercy from God to you. You see, God's mercy corrects us in our sin. That's what verse 14 says back in our text, Micah chapter 7, verse 14. God's mercy does correct us in our sin. You say, preacher, I don't like to be corrected. Well, I want you to read it, verse 14, 7, 14. Shepherd your people with your staff, the flock of your heritage. A shepherd needs a staff. There's two reasons for that. One is to bring the sheep back in when they wander off, and that is a gentle correction. I should have brought a staff here this morning. I could have demonstrated taking the crook of that staff and bringing that sheep in closer. The other reason for the staff, when they get out of hand, sometimes you have to correct them. Can I get amen right there? We have one sheep. His name is Elvis. <laughs> And he needs correcting every day. He's a wild buck. I, I mean, he's wild. He's run over our girls a couple of times. He needs some correction in his life. But you know what? It's not just for the sake of correcting him. It's for his good. What you have to understand is when we sin and when we earn the righteous judgment of God and God's justice rains down upon us, and we are under the judgment and the correction of God, it is not just to punish us, it's to bring us back to him. Do you understand God's judgment is actually merciful? This whole world is in a mess, and it is under the judgment of God. But like the prophet Jeremiah said in Lamentations, it is only by his mercies that we're not consumed. The reason we're here today, and God hasn't said, I'm done with America, and God hasn't said, I'm done with Mississippi, is because God is a merciful God. And yet he is dispensing judgment and justice on our land. And let me tell you something, friend. He'll do the same thing in your life. You're living outside the will of God. You're living in sin. God does not just turn a blind eye to that. You will earn 
the full judgment of God. And you will suffer the pain of the consequences of it because every sin has its own consequence. It has its own pain. The wages of sin is death, and we know that every person will die because of sin. But every sin actually brings spiritual death deeper down in our hearts, doesn't it? When we're living outside of God's will. But I want you to know if you're living under the conviction of sin, that conviction is the Holy Spirit of God saying to you, yes, you're wrong. Yes, you're not living right, but I'm disciplining you to bring you back to me. So God's mercy corrects us in our sins. Secondly, he delivers us from judgment. I want you to turn back to uh, Micah chapter 4, verse 9. Four, Micah 4, verse 9 through 12. I want you to read these verses. God says, being, uh, God says, why do you cry aloud? Is there no king in your midst? Has your counselor perished? Micah 4, 9. For pains have seized you like a woman in labor. Pain. Be in pain and labor to bring forth, O daughter of Zion, like a woman in birth pains. For now you shall go forth from the city, you shall dwell in the field, and to Babylon you shall go. There you shall be delivered. There the Lord will redeem you from the hand of your enemies. Isn't that interesting? God says to his people Judah and to Jerusalem, the Assyrians took care of the northern empire. The kingdom of the north is gone. God says to you in the south, in Jerusalem, you're going to Babylon. But God says, I'm not done with you. I'm going to deliver you from that judgment. In fact, he says, it is in that land. Notice in verse 10, there you shall be delivered. The Lord will redeem you from the hand of your enemies. Aren't you glad to know that no matter what you're going through, the Lord knows right where you are, and he's not left you, and he's not forsaken you. He's there with you. Amen. And he has a purpose through the pain. And God allowed his people Judah to be delivered into uh, the, 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 the uh, empire of Babylon, a terrible empire. They were actually deported from Jerusalem uh, in 586 B.C., deported from Jerusalem and Ju uh, Judea, taken over to Babylon. But God had a plan through the pain. and He had a plan of deliverance. The people of Judah, the people of Israel had struggled with one major sin their whole existence. Do you know what it was? Idolatry. They were worshiping false gods in a, in a land that God gave them. They were continuing to worship Baal and Ashtaroth. I preached about that last Sunday. They were continuing to worship these false idols and the sin of idolatry is taking anything or anyone else and putting them in the place of God. And God will not tolerate any idols. So God allowed his people to be deported to a foreign land. And it was in that foreign land in Babylon that they, the only thing they had left, they didn't have a temple left. They didn't have the sacrificial uh, system left where they could offer lambs and goats and bulls. They didn't have any system of worship left. All that they had was the word of God. They began to read it and understand that God actually had a plan for all of this. And it was in the land of Babylon that the people of Judah, of Israel, they decided they would never, ever again worship a false god. And I've got to tell you, they've never done it. Ever. They said, the Lord our God, he is one Lord. All right. God delivered them from that through that judgment. He delivered them. And there's a third thing about the mercies of God. Not only does it correct us in our sin and it delivers us from judgment, but it, God's mercy actually restores his good rule in our life, his kingdom in our life. Micah chapter 4, verse 1 through 3. I want you to read it. Micah 4. Now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills, and people shall flow to it. Many nations shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways. We shall walk in his past, and out of Zion the law shall go forth, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Verse 3, He shall judge between many peoples, he will rebuke strong nations far off. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Micah 
740 years before Jesus was born, had a vision that God was sending Jesus as king. And that King Jesus would do what all the other kings could not do. Notice Micah had said he was prophesying in the days of King Jotham and in King Ahaz and in King Hezekiah. And you know what? As good or as bad as these kings had been, they had never fulfilled God's plan. God said, I'm going I'm to send them a king. Let me say that another way. God said, I'm going to come to be their king. Flip with me to Micah chapter 5. Micah chapter 5, verse 2 through 5, through, 2 through 6. We read this scripture often at Christmas time, but I want you to listen to me. Young people, you listen to me as I read these words. This was the prophet Micah predicting Jesus' first coming. But you, Bethlehem, Micah 5, 2, but you, Bethlehem, a little town of Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from old, from everlasting. Therefore he shall give them up till the time that she who is in labor is given birth. And then the remnant of his brethren shall return to the children of Israel. He shall stand and feed his flock. He is the good shepherd. In the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord is God, and they shall abide, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and this one shall be peace when the Assyrian comes in our land. No matter what else is going wrong, Jesus brings peace. Nobody else can. Amen. You understand what I'm telling you this morning? As we are in this fall season of the year, and some of us are already thinking about Christmas time, we make preparation a month before or three weeks before Christmas to decorate our homes and prepare for the coming day, the special day. God was preparing that special day over 700 years before it actually happened. And God said to Micah, I want you to write it down that the real king is going to be born in Bethlehem. And that's why when the wise men came, they said to King Herod, hey, where is he? who has been born king of the Jews. And Herod thought he was the king. Or was he wrong? They consulted the wise men of the age, of the religious leaders, and they said, well, the Bible says, the prophet Micah said he's going to be born in Bethlehem. And he was. Now, there's also a reference here to the coming reign of Jesus Christ in the millennial kingdom, because not only did Jesus come the first time, ladies and gentlemen, he's coming again. Lift up your head. Redemption draweth nigh. Doesn't matter how much smoke you're driving through, how much darkness you're in the midst of right now, how our country is going to hell in a handbasket, and it is. But God's not done. He wasn't done in Micah's day, and he's not done in our day. God has a plan, and it's a plan of mercy to those who believe upon him. So God's mercy corrects us in our sin. It delivers us from judgment and sets us back on the right path. It restores His rule in our lives. Finally, the mercy of God pardons our guilt. Let's go back to the text and I'll be through. Micah chapter 7, verses 18 through 20. Micah's name means what? Who is like God? Who is like Jehovah? Who is a God like you? Pardoning iniquity, passing over the transgression of the remnant of his heritage. He does not retain his anger forever. He delights in mercy. He will again have compassion on us. He will subdue our iniquities. He will cast all of our sins into the depths of the sea. He will give truth to Jacob and mercy to Abraham, which you've sworn to our fathers from days of old. You see, the sin of God's own people did not frustrate the merciful plans of God. If you ever doubt it, I want you to look at the cross of Jesus Christ. The cross, the symbol of our faith, the symbol of Christianity, the symbol of the cross stands at one time both as a reference to the justice of God and the mercy of God. You say, hey, preacher, how can that be? The God of the Old Testament, he's so harsh, and he's always judging people all the time. But the new God of the New Testament is forgiving and loving. And I want to tell you, you're wrong, because he's one and the same God. 
He is in one time the God of perfect justice. And everything that is right, everything that is wrong is going to be made right because he is the God of justice. And he is also the God of mercy because he loves to forgive. You see, on the cross of Calvary, Jesus Christ hung. The King of kings, the one who was born in Bethlehem to be the ruler of the kingdom of God forever. That king hung on the cross, and above his head, a sign was made, King of the Jews. The world thought they had killed Jesus, but actually this is all part of God's plan because the Bible teaches us that all we like sheep have gone astray. We've gone everyone our own way. We've all sinned against God, and we've all done everything, including spit in the face of God in our sin. But the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. You understand that means my sin was laid on Jesus, and he suffered that judgment in my place. And friend, let me tell you something this morning. Your sin was too put on Jesus Christ, King of kings, the Lord of lords. Why did he do it? Because he loves you. He took the full righteous judgment of God. He took the full justice of God. As a matter of fact, the sky became dark and God looked away. And Jesus said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Jesus suffered the forsakenness of your sin and mine. And as his blood dripped down that cross, the justice of God was satisfied. His mercy was evident. We who were once enemies and strangers of God, now the Bible says we've been brought close by the blood of Jesus Christ. The perfect sacrifice, the only sacrifice that can pardon your sin, that can save your soul and deliver you from hell and take you to heaven forever. Jesus' blood, the mercy of God, shed in Jesus' blood, is available to anyone who believes on him. So, friend, Micah has a message that is not small. It's short, but it's not small. It's big. And it's a message that says, God, who is like our God? He is a God of justice, and he's always going to do what's right. But thank God he's a God of mercy, and there's forgiveness. And when you come to Jesus, your sins he'll remember no more. He will cast them into the depths of the sea. And he'll put up a sign that says, no fishing. Today, if you're here, God has a word for you. Maybe you are suffering the justice of God right now because of your sin. And the answer is to come to Christ and repent of it. Even Christians can go through periods of time where we walk in sin, and in those instances we confess our sins, and Jesus is faithful to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But also, friend, there's a message for you of hope, that no matter the darkness that you're going through in life, no matter the circumstances of your situation, we serve a God who makes the sun rise every day, whether we can see it or not. And the Son of God, Jesus Christ, is risen today. He's alive and he's well and he's here. And he's speaking his message of mercy to you. Would you come to Christ? Would you believe on him and be saved? And if you've been a Christian a week, a month, even many, many years, maybe today you need to be reminded that Jesus died for your sin too. And he cast them in the depth of the sea. Lord, we thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your forgiveness. And we also thank you for your righteousness. Today, I pray, Lord, you would speak to each one here, wherever we are, whatever the situation is. God, give us that message of clarity, of conviction, of sin, but also a message of mercy. Because, Lord, you don't give us what we deserve. You give us forgiveness that we don't deserve. We thank you, God, for making it possible for us to stand in your presence forever because of the shed blood of Jesus. We praise you. And all we can do, like Micah, is say, who is like our God?
God, I pray you'd help us all to do what Micah challenges us to do in Micah chapter 6. And that is to do justice and to love mercy and to walk humbly with our God. And Lord, that's the prayer for this invitation. Lord, help us to, to do what you'd have us to do. To seek and to love your mercy. And not only to receive it, but Lord, help us to show mercy and forgiveness to others. And Lord, help us all to walk humbly because there's no one like you. In Jesus' name.